Good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Lagore. Welcome to another episode of the Skywatcher What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. Uh, we cover everything from what's up in the nighttime sky to equipment to helpful tips and tricks. And of course, at the end of the month, we have a special guest on to talk about their specialty in the field of astronomy. Um, and guess what? It's the end of the month. I have no freaking idea where this year is going, but it's basically August at this point. So time warp, I guess. So anyway, um, I am super, super, super stoked to have uh, our guest on today. Uh, we got to hang out with him at the Advanced Imaging Conference, which is more of a reason to go to these events because you get to meet cool people. And uh, so today we have Dr. Phil Plate joining us today, and I'm going to bring in Phil right now. Good morning, Phil. How are you? Hey, Jeff. Doing pretty good, actually. So, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my little name tag still does say Jeff. Uh, oh, wait. Jeff's my boss. I'm Kevin. So it's I'm like, sorry. I did say that's Jeff, our, and I knew that's that. That's our. I, I, I just normally, glanced up and saw, Oh God. So I, I let's normally, start this again. We're not live, are we? Um, now it, oh, so <laughs> yeah, I just I, I, I saw the name and just that's what stuck in my head. I oh. normally change that. So <laughs> Jeff, we need to change the default. It's not your name. So so. Um, anyway, good morning. Thank you for joining us. I where are you actually at? I'm right here. I'm on the internet. There you, yeah. um, I exist as an unbound cloud of electrons. Um, no, I'm in Colorado, uh, uh, north of Boulder, out in the in the wilderness, kind of, just out in a rural area. Nice. Yeah, it's pretty nice out here. I like it. Perfect. Um, so I start these interviews off the same way every time because I like to get people's background. How did you get started in astronomy or your interest in space? How did that snowball into kind of the re career that you've actually grown into now <laughs> yeah uh, a series of stochastic events i um i get this question a lot and it's <laughs> it's never easy to answer um because i mean it, a lot of astronomers and and people who study space astronauts all these folks they'll they'll they always have a story where they saw the moon or saturn through a telescope for the first time and and yeah that happened with me saturn i i you know, I was really young. I was probably five or six. Uh, so I don't know the exact circumstances. And one of these days I should just look it up. But I'm kind of guessing that Saturn was probably at opposition. So it was at that time of the year when it was up all night and closest and biggest and, and brightest. And so my parents bought a small telescope, a Tasco uh, three inch refractor uh, built on a really sturdy tripod uh, that was basically made out of you know, spider silk and, and fairy dust. It was, you know, it was super unsteady, Alum cast aluminum or something. It fell apart after a few years, but I used to take care of it a lot. Spider yeah, I saw Saturn through awesome. that. And it was like, oh yeah, oh yeah. But I already, even then, I mean, I remember when I was really little, like my earliest memories, I loved uh, astronauts. And this was during the Apollo program because I'm super mm -hmm. old. Um, but space, astronomy, science, science fiction, all that stuff. Uh, and so that probably, that was sort of a, a, a solidifying moment. Uh, but I always, I always loved this stuff and I always knew I wanted to be an astronomer. So, you know, all through high school and then college, I studied astronomy and then got my PhD and worked on uh, Hubble data for a while uh, and, and wound up starting a website, uh, which was, you know, brand new in 1993, four, something like that. Uh, and, and then as, as the web, as the internet got more popular, it became easier to put everything together, get a URL and, uh, and write about astronomy. And now here I am, uh, talking to you. So I was talking to, I appreciate you giving me the background <laughs> on yourself, but, um, I was talking to some friends of mine this morning about you and we were talking cause uh -oh. they're probably watching right now. Where does the bad astronomer title originate from? Uh, it's because... In that, that first, um, literally the first web page I put up, and this is when I was at the University of Virginia. So it had this horrific <coughs> URL, like like uh, uh, virginia.astronomy.edu slash my username slash all this stuff. And uh, you couldn't just have a, you couldn't buy a domain name at that point. But I, I, I had seen on TV, let's see, in 93... I'm pretty sure it was March of 93, and this is an old legend that's been around since the 40s, and you don't hear about it much anymore, 
but uh, there's this urban legend that you can stand eggs on end on the first day of spring. You can take an egg and you know set it on a tabletop and and it'll balance on its on its end. Uh, it's ridiculous. It's nonsense. It, it turns out you can do this anytime. It's it's hard to do, but you can do it. Uh, but I'd seen on the local news or something they were talking about this, and 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 it was it was you know back in the day it wasn't viral, but it was people were talking about it. So I was like, no, this is baloney. I wrote up an article about it, stuck it up on the on the World Wide Web. Ooh, and I had a hyperlink in it and an inline image. It Whoa. was very sophisticated. <laughs> um, and I started. It, it was like the first of of a long line of debunking. Myths and misconceptions about astronomy. Then I started calling it bad astronomy. There was a website at the time called Bad Science, which uh, was a guy who was actually talking about. It was more about weather. He was debunking bad ideas about weather and stuff like that. Um, but I liked that idea, bad science. So I, I actually emailed him and said, Hey, can I use that? Call mine bad astronomy. He was like, Yeah, sure. I don't, I don't own that idea. Uh, and eventually in '98, I bought the URL, and people started calling me the bad astronomer. And I thought that's that's pretty funny. I like it. Uh, I didn't really think it would lead to any issues. Uh, but of course, a lot of people... Eventually, I went from debunking myths and misconceptions to taking on more political topics and then you know things like climate change and stuff like that. And so people who were against me would then say, bad astronomer, what a, you know, what an apropos name. Uh, they wouldn't use the word apropos, but you know, they would say it like that. He sure is a bad astronomer. And I... Yeah. Oh. Wow, that's the first time I've heard that from some, you know, chucklehead who thinks the earth is flat. So that's that's how that came about. My mom never liked it. Uh, she always thought it was unflattering. But I said, nah, it's great. It's a nickname. People like it. And it's easy to remember. Yeah, but it it kind of, I've always liked that because it, it you kind of know what you're going, I, at least I understood what you were going for with that, where you're debunking things. And I think at this day and age, we really need <laughs> That yeah, kind 20, of stuff. 20, 30 years of doing this has really shown a lot of progress. I was just yeah. talking to somebody the other day. It's like it, it's like it's like I just took all this effort and threw it off a cliff into the ocean. <laughs> you know, here we are. This isn't working. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I think with anything in astronomy, whether it's, you know, education like you do, or even if you're, you know, out like I am with the telescopes just doing outreach, it's a very uphill battle to just generally educate people on science and that's yeah. kind of how it is on a lot of things nowadays because you just hear so many like oh i heard about the blood moon or even if stuff is like relatively on the right track it's yeah. still kind of you don't have all the pieces of the puzzle so yeah, i think it is and, important and it, it can be tough because you know how do you do this when the when the term super moon came out um i i was conflicted it's like well this is a this is interesting because if it gets people interested in going outside and looking at the moon, that's great. On the other hand, the term was invented by an astrologer, uh, and it, it, the difference in size in, in in the moon is like ten percent. And so if you go out the night before and look at the moon, and then go out at the full moon, it, it the, the difference is so small. It's not even ten percent. It's it's a fraction of a percent day to day. Uh, it's like you're not going to see this difference. And so do I want to debunk this? and wind up taking away people's enthusiasm for what they're doing or to say, hey, look, this is neat. It, you know, yes, this it is it is true in general that the moon is bigger and brighter because it's closer to the earth. But, you know, and so I tried to do it that way without sort of uh, yucking anybody's yum, as the expression goes. I just want to I want to support people's enthusiasm, but I want them to get the right information. And that is a fine line to tread. Sometimes. It is a very delicate line, <laughs> because especially when you have people who maybe are just getting into science or astronomy because you can very easily go over someone's head and make them feel like they're stupid or insignificant yeah. on what they're doing. I always like to tell people, it's like you at an event, it's like you want to be the person that you can talk science, but you can go get a drink with after is kind of how I like to <laughs> lay things out where you want to be able to talk at their level, even about complex subjects, which is something I think you'll agree that I really like about astronomy is you can go to an outreach event and get people from all types of walks of life, whether whatever their belief system is, whatever their, you know, uh, races, whatever their creed, it doesn't matter. 
and you can just end up having this crazy deep conversation with people suddenly and everyone is completely civil because they're all grounded and rooted to astronomy and we're talking from that root rather than i believe it's this and i believe it's that and right you really get i really think it's cool to watch kind of the philosophical side of people just come out and be able to have that kind of discussion because it's so rare with social media and all that garbage we have today where people are just trying to you know kill each other over it so yeah um but i think astronomy has that unique capability when in the right place to open up people to different thoughts so um, yeah, as long as a flat earther doesn't show up or something. Oh, like well, that, that's you know, just but... like someone like riding a bike and then taking a stick and shoving <laughs> yeah, it in the true. wheel. It's just like, well, there that yeah. went. We had great forward momentum, but it was just like, well, we're cool. done now. Yeah, I did. Yeah, we're I've, done. I've said that many times in conversations. Yes. <laughs> this conversation has flatlined thanks yeah. to the flag guy. So it's like, <laughs> um, so, um, Oh my goodness, I had a question and it just disappeared. So we'll just have to route back to that. Um, so you, what I think is kind of interesting with you is you've worked. Oh, I know what it is. I'm sorry. Um, you, I don't know how it came about. You have to tell me, but you did the the crash course segments on YouTube. And when I was, I um, I don't know. I think I've shown you before. I have my meteorite displays, which I showed you at. Oh, I saw those pictures. Conference. Yeah, they were really sweet. Um, very nice. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I have two custom meteorite displays I take out to my outreach events. You can go to focusastro.org and check them out. But there we go. I think Campo. I told you about this one when we were uh, when, uh, after the meeting and we were sitting around. Yeah, uh, a big it's a, campo. It's a campo. Yeah, it's about half a kilo. It's you know it's substantial and it's solid iron, and nice. it's yeah, it's like a cannonball. Yeah, um, mine's all put away. I should have brought it out, but um, <laughs> I've got a couple more around here. I don't even. Yeah. Oh, here you go. You recognize that? You uh, won't. it's hard to. See. Yeah, it's hard to tell. It's a piece of Chelyabinsk. That's a nice piece of Chelyabinsk. Yeah, so. a friend of mine got me got me a small piece of the one that blew up over Russia. Uh, golly, what? Twenty thirteen. Yeah. Two thirteen. I have a little yes, piece of that. I always, but, I always get that backwards, 2013, 2015. I think that's right. Yeah, gosh, if we're coming up on 10 years on that, oh, my God. <laughs> Anniversary. Yeah. Um, I wanted to do a, a similar case, but I wanted to have, like, gold, silver, platinum, and actually talk about where elements that we see in the day-to-day -day and how they came around. And your right. Crash Course series was very – it never came to be because it got so complicated trying to talk about that. Uh, subject on supernovas and how they make gold and silver and like trying to fit that into a tiny box was complicated but your web series crash course was immensely helpful for me to understand oh. that process but was that cool. i don't know a lot about crash course because i it's a it's a whole thing but were you <laughs> yes. Um, yes it is you were brought in to host that segment yeah, um, so Crash Course is a series of videos. Um, they're short videos, typically you know around 10 minutes, uh, and they're a bunch of different series on different topics. And uh, I mean, there's, there's, gosh, well, it's run by uh, John and Hank Green, uh, the Vlog Brothers, as they used to be called. Uh, now, of course, best-selling authors and just internet uh, uh, stars, whatever. Also, just genuinely good people i mean what you see of them on the internet that's that's kind of who they are they really 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 want to make the world a better place and their motto is uh to decrease world suck mm -hmm. uh, and dftba which is don't forget to be awesome <laughs> they just they want people to to just make the world a better place uh and and they've done a fantastic job and crash courses like that so they've got like anatomy and um a history and all these different topics and I was at Comic Con in San Diego a few years ago, and Derek Muller from uh, Veritasium, who who makes these amazing uh, science videos, came up to me and said, "Hey, I was talking to Hank Green, and we wanted to do uh, uh, Crash Course Astronomy, and and so I'm just in, I'm an intermediary here. I want to see if you know if you're interested." And I was like, "Well, yeah, sure. Let me let me you know think about this." And I didn't know that much about Crash Course and 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 John and Hank, and went home at the time that is and research and it was like oh this is huge and i mentioned it to my wife and daughter now my daughter at the time was a, like a i don't know how old was she a teenager 
And when I said, yeah, so Hank Green wants me to do Crash Course, her eyes got really big, and I thought, oh, maybe I should do this. <laughs> and, and yeah, so it's, it, it's, um, I wrote it and hosted it. Uh, 46 episodes, and I wish I could have made, made 70. Uh, I had to, like, not even cover some topics. And they're, they're short 10-minute videos covering, you know, the Earth, Moon, uh, Tides, meteors asteroids and then things like galaxies and the big bang and it, it starts sort of here what you looking up in the sky what you can see in the solar system and then black it gets holes very and all that, complex and then cosmology trying to build on the on the earlier episodes no it and it, a lot it's of work so well done and if anybody's like looking to get into astronomy or you really want to what I find a lot of people end up doing, especially if you're an astrophotographer, it seems like you get into it because it's like, I like to take pictures, but you don't know a lot about what you're what you're shooting. The Crash Course episodes, I like that they're super organized. It's like, what's a nebula? Whole video on that. What's, you know, yeah. whatever. It's all so well organized. And I was blown away with that whole series. And it, every single person who's into astronomy should watch those. So. I agree. <laughs> I agree. It was, it was a lot of work. I mean, writing those and then uh, editing, 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 and then I'd fly up to Montana and we'd shoot them in batches of, of seven or eight, something like that, and I'd come home. Uh, yeah, and and then the editing afterwards, which I didn't do. I mean, once we filmed it, I was involved with sort of the post production stuff. You know, what what images do we want to use? That sort of thing. But uh, we, uh, Nick Jenkins and Nicole Sweeney, who were my director and, and, and she was the editor, went in and, and made them all pretty and, and made them flow well. And yeah, it has, last time I checked, it was a couple of months ago, it had over 70 million views on all the, uh, the combined uh, episodes. So, yeah, I mean, holy cow. I was never expecting yeah. anything like that. It's one of the best series I've ever seen. And oh, it's wow. so well organized. It just makes it very easy to digest, which I think is really important when we're talking about astronomy because i think a lot of a lot of, i mean you've done a lot of uh different you know uh tv series and you've been on as a speaker for different things and i feel like a lot of time when you get those one hour segments on a particular thing you know you kind of have to slot through what you want to actually see if you're trying to teach something where that series is easy to digest because like you said it's 10 minutes long and it's on a very particular subject it's like today we're going to learn about this that's it so nice well that's clean. why it's called crash course right it's, it's it's designed like a like a curriculum like you're like you're yeah. attending a class but it's it, or a lecture or something it's just short you know hit the high points and uh and and if people want to learn more that you know you have the entire internet out there where you can get more information if you need it yeah but I, I think it's cool that you wrote it and helped with it because then you know it's coming from an accurate source. It's not just, I wrote this on Wikipedia. Yeah. It's like, well, it's accurate as I could not... make it at the time. Yeah. yeah. But it's always changing. Um, and speaking of changes, let's segue into that. Um, we have a big, fancy new telescope that's floating around out there right now. And you've worked on a previous big, fancy orbiting telescope, the Hubble. Um, what did you actually do uh, for the Hubble team? Like, what were you actually doing with Hubble? <laughs> it seems like a deceptively simple question, doesn't it? Um, in, so uh, in 1990 is where that started. I was working, I just finished my master's degree at University of Virginia, and I was kind of trolling around looking for a PhD research, and I wasn't finding a whole lot, actually. Uh, but then one of the professors, Roger Chevalier, who studies uh, supernovae, exploding stars, said, listen, I'm part of a project that's coming up on Hubble, which launches in like literally less than a month. Do you want to do that? And I was like, yes, I would like to work on this big new space telescope. Uh, and so for like two or three weeks, I was reading, you know, stacks of manuals and all this stuff, learning about everything. Uh, and then they launched it and then it was out of focus. That was so much fun. What a fun two years that turned into. Um, uh, I think that's why I, I've lost all my hair, actually, was just <laughs> uh, having unfocused pictures was really hard. Um, but I wound up getting my Ph.D. with observations from that and then got a job uh, uh, working on a different satellite for a short time, but then uh, segued back into working on Hubble uh, in the industry. I worked for a contractor with NASA that was um, uh, tasked with helping to calibrate and understand a new camera called the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, STIS, 
which was a new camera that was going to be launched and put on Hubble in 97. And so they were building this new camera. It's got filters, gratings, uh, mirrors, uh, all these different moving parts. It was actually, it's an incredibly complicated camera. Uh, and you, we needed to understand it. You know, if you beam light at this wavelength at this mirror, how much of it reflects off? 90%, 90.1%? It turns out these numbers are important. Uh, and then um, once we understood that, I had to write software that basically said, okay, so you're going to use Hubble. You're an astronomer. You're going to point Hubble at a star. Your star that you want to observe is 14th magnitude, whatever. How long of an exposure do you need to get the data that you want? You're going to measure some aspect of this. How long? It's called an exposure time calculator. And I basically wrote this immense software package because this, you could take pictures, you could take spectra. It was ultraviolet. It was optical. It was near infrared. There was all these different things going on. Um, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life was writing all that software. Uh, but I managed to do it uh, and um, uh, it worked, which was lovely. Um, once, you know, once we started uh, actually getting observations with STIS, I was able to go back in and, you know, change everything to make it, make it so that it worked. Uh, and yeah, and that, was, that, that software was then adapted by the folks at Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, which runs the telescope. And you know, still being used. This is still up there and, and operating, and uh, I see papers using it all the time, which makes me very happy. That must be cool to actually see the thing that you worked on is actually still running and producing. Like, yeah, and it's really you know. fun when when I see a paper. It's like we observed, you know, a planetary nebula with stis, blah blah blah. And it's like, oh, they were using uh, the fifty two by point one inch uh, 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 arc second slit and it must have been in this quite, mode and, quite, and, and so yes. and, I, and I, I want to email them and say hey did you have to worry about ghost images and fringes and blah blah and I'm like yeah the hell with that I'm just gonna you know write up what they've done and, and just smile to myself that I understand how that was all taken so being that you've worked with Hubble obviously when you're an astrophotographer or even if you're a professional astronomer usually the way like a professional observatory works is they have like their observer who actually runs the telescope um they collect the data and then that data is then provided i'm sure to some extent to the studying astronomer that's on whatever the project is at that point is hubble run the same way where you have like the the observers if you will running the actual commands to the satellites um and then they then provide the data to the astronomy team that's doing the research on that project? Yeah. Um, if, if you want to boil it all down to its essentials, that's basically what's going on. Um, in Baltimore, on the Johns Hopkins University campus, is the Space Telescope Science Institute. Everybody just calls it the toot. And um, that's where Hubble is being run. It's also uh, run out of Goddard Space Flight Center, which is down the road in, in um, uh, Greenbelt, Maryland. It's not that, not that far. And I, when I worked at Goddard Space Flight Center, um, I would commonly drive up to Baltimore. It happened several times to, to have meetings or whatever. Uh, and so um, so Goddard is, it, well, let me put it this way. At the Institute, they're the ones who, are, who do all the science programming of Hubble. So if you need to, to observe it or, whatever, or to observe something or whatever, there are people there, engineers there, who will upload these commands to the telescope. Uh, and it goes through Goddard. So Goddard takes care of all of like the, um, the mechanics of this, taking care of the telescope, uh, its orbit, where it is, and all that kind of stuff. And the Institute takes care of the science pointing. I'm, I'm really, really glossing over huge oh, numbers of details. there's massive things that's got to go I'm on. bordering on, I'm, what I'm saying, I'm, it's bordering on wrong. It's right, it's, it simplifies as much as possible, but no further. And I'm, I'm right there at the edge. It's a lot more complicated than this, but there is a, a team of engineers who, who, watch the telescope making sure that it's healthy you know it's it you know it, it it's not getting too hot too cold that all the systems are working i mean stis for example uh stopped working in in 2004 i can't remember the exact date but basically it shorted out a uh, motherboard uh, uh shorted out and um the eventually they had to go up and uh and replace that motherboard an astronaut mike massimino opened up the doors, you know, looked in STIS, yanked out that motherboard and stuck in a new one. Uh, it was it was a huge undertaking. And so, all, you know, all of that kind of stuff has to be taken care of, and that's what's going on there with NASA and the Institute. In the meantime, you know, if you're an astronomer and you want to use, say, Hubble, uh, it's like, I have an idea. I want, I, you know, I've got this science problem. 
I, uh, I've used ground-based telescopes. I, I really need ultraviolet observations, which you can't get from the ground. I need, you know, 0.1 arc second resolution, which is tough to get from the ground. There's some reason you need to use Hubble versus Keck or, or whatever. Uh, and so you put together your proposal and you say, okay, I'm gonna observe this, these objects. Here's why I need to use Hubble. And um, you know what, let me back up a little bit. So, so the way you, you use an observatory, pretty much any observatory, but specifically with Hubble, is there are, are what they call cycles. So it's, it's roughly a year and, and then NASA will put out a call for proposals and say, we are now in cycle, we're in cycle one. This is in 1990. Uh, and if you want to observe using Hubble, you know, let us know what it is you want to do. And so they put out the call. Astronomers figure out what they want to do, why they have to use Hubble and, and what, what it is they're doing. They submit their proposal and it's not an observing proposal. This is more of an overview. It's like a summary of, of what, what they're trying to do. And then NASA has a telescope allocation committee attack made up of astronomers and they get these hundreds of proposals and they rank them and they say this is clearly you know they can they can do this on a four meter on the ground from chile we mm -hmm. don't need to use hubble for that or this one has um this is good but it has very little chance of actually working it's a little too risky so we're not going to do that one and they rank them that way uh and then the top whatever get uh accepted and then you go into phase two if you're an astronomer where then you say okay now I have to figure out what observations I need. I'm going to use STIS. I'm going to take a spectrum. It's going to be in near UV. I'm going to use this grading, and I'm going to take this many observations and split them this way. You, know, you have to figure all that stuff out. It is really hard. You kind of have to understand the telescope and how it works. Because mm -hmm. um, on the ground, um, uh, if, you're, if you've got a, you know, a Skywatcher telescope, for example, um, you can sit there and take half hour exposures and, and lock on to something and, and just do it robotically, like for the night, or just sit with it and do it. But with Hubble, you can't do that. You, your, your exposure times are limited because it's getting bombarded by cosmic rays all the time. And if you take a long exposure, it looks like somebody's taking a shotgun to your image. It's just covered in streaks. And so you gotta, you gotta understand all of these details to be able to take this data. Um, then, well, then you, you, you give it to the, uh, the committee, they look it over and make sure it's possible. Uh, and eventually that gets scheduled, uh, turned into code, uploaded to the telescope. And then you wait and you wait and you wait and you wait and you wait, and you wait, and you wait. And then some months later, uh, you get your observations. Those come down, they're put into an archive, uh, and then you have access to them. And typically, um, they're proprietary for a year, which means that's your data. Nobody else can see it unless you give it to them. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, there are people at the Institute who will have access to it because you might have questions like, I need to know how to calibrate this. I need to do flat fields and darks and biases, and I don't know how to do that. Um, but then you get a year to work on that data. And basically that's to give you enough time to learn how that telescope performs uh, and be able to process the data and everything and then start writing about it. You can analyze it and then start getting your paper out before some other astronomer who may know how Hubble works a lot better comes in and grabs your data and publishes before you. Um, yeah. It's a balance between these two things. So that that's, in a sense, that's how all this works. And then after a year, it becomes public. So, you know, basically any data that Hubble's taken up until July of 2021, uh, you could go into the archive right now and grab it and look at it. Hmm. Not that it's easy. No, uh, that raw data. I've is... seen people get Hubble data and process it for the fun of it, but I think you have to dig pretty deep to get down into there. So. Yeah, um, people like Judy Schmidt, who's a space geck on Twitter, and I think Geckzilla on on Flickr. You can look her up. I I I, I I'm looking at images on my desktop right now. I'm going to be writing about them on Monday. Um, yeah, she loves doing that, going into the archives, pulling out data, and processing it. And you've it, it, a lot of it, it it's kind of like, you know, you can go out now. When I, when I was an amateur, bef before CCDs existed even, you know, if I wanted, if I wanted to take pictures of the sky, I'd, I'd rolled my own film and mm -hmm. loaded it loaded up into my Konica TC. Is that what it was? This, this, you were talking when I was in high school, right? Uh, I had a newspaper route so I could afford all this stuff. And, uh, uh, and then when CCDs came out, it was still you had to write your own software. And when I was my PhD, I wrote my own software to calibrate everything. Um, now though, there are packages. And so the Institute, 
you, you will go and say just calibrate my data and, it, and they will they will process basically it, it, it software you use that processes it for you and you get this this finished thing and there is some interactivity because you know maybe not all the cosmic rays went away or maybe there's a better flat field that's available or something like that that's come up since since you took your images but a lot of it is, is automated now but still, if you that that's for science data, which is good for processing and or is good for analyzing and, and making your paper. But if you want to make a pretty picture, that's a different path to take. And, yeah, and definitely. A lot of Photoshop and cosmetic stuff, uh, and so you kind of have to know how to calibrate the data like a scientist, and then you have to know how to how to process the data and make it pretty like an artist. Yeah, uh, Judy is. And it's not your typical LRGB filter set either. Those uh, are probably photometrics and stuff like that. Almost never. Um, yeah. You got a lot of narrow band filters, and um, and these are, you know, I, I got spoiled using Hubble, and then and then talking to friends of mine who are amateurs, uh, and they would they would talk about their their you know their their electron noise or whatever in their detector, and they would give me numbers, and I think that can't be right. Because you know our our electron noise was 0. 0.0007 electrons per day or something. Because you know these are really really expensive, high quality, absolutely bleeding edge detectors. This is why these cameras cost tens of millions of dollars. And and so it was kind of hard coming back down to the ground and, and to just just even talking about astrophotography because it's it's really different being up in space and having you know having a hundred million dollar camera. Uh, to work yeah, we with. were. Um... We we're down in or down in Tucson uh, with our friends at Star Arizona, and uh, yeah, they U of A obviously they have people all over the place, but one of their friends and now I've come friends with him. Um, one night they were hanging out there. They were literally imaging from Hawaii on Mauna Kea at the nice. store, just remoting in. And they're just like, oh, the scene's terrible tonight. It's like, what is it like? It's like one arc second. It's like it's terrible. It's like most amateurs would kill yeah. to have seeing of that and then of course so that's you know Mauna Kea and then of course they step up to you who's like space telescope and it's just like oh that's atrocious seeing it's just yeah. like that yeah, would our, never our, be acceptable so. the core of our point spread function is like you know a quarter of an arc second or or, or smaller than that and I mean yeah. I look out my window here and I can see mountains and so the air that flows over those mountains is can be very turbulent and I'll have three four five arc seconds seeing sometimes it's like yeah uh, even binoculars is a little tough tonight. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and you just get used to it. And on the other hand, getting flat fields uh, in space super hard. You, you could you can almost literally get a piece of poster board and, and illuminate it and use that as a flat field uh, on 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 your on if you're using you know 25 centimeter telescope or whatever on the ground. It's not that easy. It's got to be you know illuminated evenly and there's all this stuff. But it's it's possible. But how do you do that in space? You can't point Hubble anywhere in the sky, uh, and 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 ha not have stuff in it. And so we wound up pointing it at the Earth, and oh. letting the Earth streak hey. by. So that you know, there's works. Hubble's, yeah, I know, right? It, Hubble is they're called Earth flats. Hubble is 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 orbiting the Earth at what eight kilometers a second, something like that, five miles per second. Point it straight down, and as as the Earth streaks by, you're basically. Um, uh, illuminating the detector evenly it's not that simple and there's a lot of sophisticated software because trees will streak by i mean it, it really it, the the resolution per pixel on earth is small on for hubble you're seeing things uh and and so they also call them streak flats because if you see them raw um there's all these dark streaks through them and that could be you know anything buildings or yeah. whatever uh, and 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 building up a flat field from that is a nightmare um, mathematically trying to figure that out. So yeah, some things are easy, some things are hard. It, it's it's never the case of pointing a telescope anywhere and just being able to take data. It's always a complicated processing package. I don't want to hear any of you complain about changing out the motor board in your mount anymore or taking flats because it's not as bad as it could be. <laughs> yeah, you don't need you don't need to spend a billion dollar Hubble flight and train an astronaut for a year and a half. <laughs> yeah exactly to unscrew was 111 screws to get that to get that motherboard out of stis yeah it's, i have it, to oh. send my mount in for a month to get the board fixed oh we have those in stock no big deal it's oh like, yeah and, I, and i'm sitting here i've got i've got a, a an eight inch telescope sitting on the other side of my desk here and it's like oh there's a comet out but uh, 
there are mosquitoes or it's too cold or I'm tired. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's like, you jerk. <laughs> <laughs> this could be a lot worse. So yeah. Yes. Yeah. Perspective. So now that you've worked on Hubble, Hubble's been doing its thing. It's still doing its thing. Now Hubble's got its big sister hanging out even further <laughs> and they're not really twins at all because obviously web runs in ir and where um, hubble is optical um what are your thoughts of comparing i mean and hubble of course being just outside just orbiting earth at and it's a 61 inch telescope 2.4 meter aperture yeah. telescope where the web is 165 inch, so six and a half meters. I, I did the math. It's 7.3 times the light gathering power for the web. Yeah, that's about um, right. Yeah. Plus, it's way out um, at the Lagrange points at that point as well. So uh, what are your thoughts, having now seen the images that are coming in from the web uh, about the future of space telescopes or even comparing Hubble versus the web? <sighs> It's wow. There's there's a lot of ways to talk about this, right? I mean, um, a lot of people used to talk about JWST back when it was the NGST, the Next Generation Space Telescope, um, as being Hubble's Hubble's replacement. I'd see that in the newspapers a lot. And it's like, no, these are doing two different things. It's like having mm-hmm. a, a, a a Mini Cooper in your garage and a pickup truck. It's like they're they're both vehicles, but they do totally different things. Um, it's the same thing it. here, Hubble. Uh, is designed to look in the ultraviolet, visible, and, you know, near infrared, out to about a micron wavelength, something like that, a little bit farther. Um, JWST does get down. I actually was surprised. I didn't think it got this far blue, but it gets down to 0.6 microns, which is red. You know, 600, 600, uh, 6,000 angstrom. Okay, so they're just inside the visible. So they get the hydrogen alpha lines and stuff like that. I I think it can see that. You know, I I was just looking this up, too. I want to say it was um, the near spec, which is the near infrared spectrograph that can get down that blue. Um, But it's super not sensitive down to that wavelength. It's, you know, you, you talk about percentages for every for every photon that hits the mirror, basically, how much of that do you actually get? And that, that we call that the quantum efficiency. It's you're, 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 you, the mirror absorbs light and there's several mirrors in the path. The camera optics absorb light. Uh, and so in the end, you have, a, you have an efficiency. Uh, and down, down there, you know, at, at 0.6 microns, it's, you know, you're dropping down into the ten, tens of percent. Whereas at five microns, well, maybe two microns, that's where the near-infrared camera is really you know, way up there in the, in, I'd have to look at the numbers, but you know, 70, 80, 90%, that, that thing. Um, so they're very different that way. Uh, yeah. And, and, and one of the huge disadvantages of Hubble is that, um, it was launched by the space shuttle and, and the space shuttle can only put it in low earth orbit. And so, you know, unless you're pointing and it's orbiting the earth like this, and if you're pointing like at the North pole, you can see it continuously. There's these continuous viewing zones at the North and South Poles. But if you're looking at something, say, over here, when you orbit around to the backside of the Earth, the Earth's in the way. And so for half the time, you can't observe. And that's really irritating. So you uh, still have some of time. the same limitations of Earth-based telescopes, yes. then, depending on the target. So. I mean, you can think of it, it's just like in, in, in amateur astronomy, you don't observe during the day. You're on mm-hmm. the wrong side of the Earth. And so that's true for Hubble as well. It's just that its days are an hour and a half long. And so for 40 minutes or whatever, um, it, it's it's looking in the wrong part of the sky. The Earth is in the way. Um, and Was that that's, the that's, reason that's, they did like the deep field? Because you could sit and sit? Is that in one of those uh, constantly observable spots then? Yes. When you look at the deep fields, at least the early ones, I'd have to look at, I'd have to make sure for the later ones. I'm pretty sure it's the same. Um, they were in very northern or very southern latitudes. They, the, the first deep field, the Hubble deep field, is was in Ursa Major, I think, I want to say. Uh, and they did a southern deep field when I was working on STIS. Uh, uh, and, and just to let you know, um, we got that data. So STIS, STIS is very sensitive, has a broad wavelength range, so it, ga- it just sucks down light. And uh, when we got all the data, I remember playing with it and putting all of the images together and, and just like doing a little bit of aperture photometry and we were we were easily getting down to 29.5 magnitude and i think oh, eventually wow. that was pushed to 30 30.5 something like that so holy cow were we seeing faint 
and and I say that on purpose because now with, with JWST, that's um, at the L2 point, the Lagrange 2 point, which is about four or five times out farther than the moon. Uh, and it's got this gigantic shade which blocks sunlight, moonlight, earth light. It, it, it can't observe half the sky. It can look basically anywhere in the sky that's pointing away from its, the sun. And if you want to observe something on that part of the sky, you just have to wait a few months for, that to, for, you know, for the Earth and, and JWST to come around to be able to see that. Um, but when it's looking at something, it can look continuously. So when you look at like, um, these early release images, the, uh, this, uh, this cluster of galaxies, SMAX 0723, SMAX, um, you can you can look at the Hubble image of it, which is quite good actually, and it's about a 12-hour exposure. The JWST exposure is also about 12 hours, and you're seeing much much deeper. It's a bigger telescope. Um, these these faint distant galaxies that are at you know, the edge of the observable universe, their their ultraviolet light has been redshifted to infrared. Those don't show up in Hubble. Um, mm. It just can't see them because these things don't even start emitting light in a in a in a spectral sense until you're in the infrared they just don't emit any any visible light um, i guess that makes sense i never actually thought about because of how far we're looking at you're dealing with immense redshift so it yes. makes more sense to have an infrared telescope for that when you're observing that far that's exactly so. it i mean basically you can say you know what kind of light what's the bluest light a galaxy can emit and it turns out it's it's the it's lyman alpha it's it's at about um was that 0 0.09 microns i think of it in 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 terms of uh uh, angstroms. It's 912 angstroms, and I, you know everybody has their units. Um, but it, this is in the ultraviolet, and uh, that is enough to ionize hydrogen. You've got all this hydrogen gas floating around. Um, you emit an ultraviolet photon at that wavelength, and it blows the electron off that hydrogen. And then any light with with a longer wavelength than that will be absorbed by all that gas and doesn't get out. So basically, the bluest light you see from a galaxy is in the ultraviolet. If that galaxy is then redshifted out to a factor of 10, it's so far away that it's just screaming away from us. Uh, and it's those wavelengths are Doppler shifted out that long. It's not really a Doppler shift, but close enough. Um, yeah, now you're starting to talk about a micron wavelength. And Hubble can kind of see that. So, you know, going out to a redshift of 10 or 11 or so, Hubble can do. Not, not that well, but it can. Well, that's, that's, where, that's where JWST is starting. Uh, redshift of 10 is a piece of cake for it. Uh, and that's why, you know, all these, all these press releases are coming out. It's like, yeah, we see a Z of 15, 16, 17 galaxy. These are unconfirmed because what you're doing is you're looking at the light from that galaxy, breaking it up into colors and saying, we see light starting at two microns, but at one micron, we don't see anything. And that means, oh, it must be redshifted so that that blue light is somewhere in that wavelength range. And that's where you start seeing the light. And so that's called a photometric redshift. It works. It's a good estimate, but it's not confirmation. There are things that can screw that up. And so all of these galaxies you're hearing about that are 200 million, 300 million years after the Big Bang, they're candidates. And when we get spectroscopy, that's when you're starting to look at like oxygen emission and neon and hydrogen emission. And then we'll see the spectra and go, oh yeah, that is, that is in fact a redshift of 14. Or no, this is something else that was fooling us. And that should happen soon. Mm -hmm. But it, it, th th that's kind of off of where I was going. But the, the kind of the whole point is, yeah, in, in 12 hours of JWST time, um, it was seeing these galaxies and pulling them up uh, without too much problem. Whereas Hubble could literally not do that. It's just incapable of doing that sort of work. It's just kind of a, a different net for a different type of fish. Exactly. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, when I saw these images, I was like, it's funny. We're seeing infrared. And when you look at the image... The, the colors that they used and the resolution is, the resolution of JWST is very similar to Hubble at these wavelengths. It's a fraction of an arc second. And when you compare the images, they kind of look alike. You can see a lot of the same arcs and a lot of the same galaxies. Um, and they, they kind of use the same colors. And so when I first saw it, I was like, well, that just looks like a gravitationally lensed gra gra galaxy cluster from Hubble. So that was my literally my very first impression. Then I started looking at it more carefully and it was like, oh, uh, yeah, there's a lot more to see here, and, and this is going to be pretty impressive. And then, the, you know, these, these results started coming out. And um, I, even, even like the planetary nebula image, this, this southern ring nebula, looks a lot like the Hubble image of this dying star. But then you realize, oh, what we're seeing here is cold molecular gas, which Hubble can't see at all. This stuff is way out in the infrared. 
And so the the overall structure you're seeing is 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 kind of the same, but then you're seeing additional things on top of it, uh, and that's I think that's where the true power of this is. And then when you look at these images of of spiral galaxies that look like these eerie skeletal structures, because what you're seeing is just the dust. You're not seeing stars. You're not seeing warm gas clouds that you're used to seeing in Hubble images. And uh, the, the, the power of JWST really uh, get, hits home when you start looking at I'm that stuff. sure the ones that, one of the biggest ones I think amateurs will be able to relate to is probably when it gets its hands on like M1 and doing like the pulsars inside of M1 and stuff Yeah, like that. that'll be a while, I think, um, because it, 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 you have to mosaic it. The, 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 the field of view is kind of small. And, and you know, on the other hand, M74, uh, the galaxy in... Mm -hmm. Not Circinus. Um, uh, 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 I want to say it's like the Firework Galaxy or whatever its name there's, is. There's a bunch of them. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just blanking on it. But there are a bunch of, you know, the, they've already observed M74, which is a binoculars. Well, if you're in a dark side, it's a binoculars object. And so the detail on that is staggering. Um, I know that uh, Supernova 1987A has been observed or will be soon. Uh, and there's a bunch of other, you know, when you look at the list of targets, they're going to be familiar. Uh, because yeah. well, they, they have first to... year... They want the big splashy results, and then or it, we spent I mean, it's, it's driven ten billion by science, science. But yeah. you know, if you're getting really good science out of a really cool galaxy, uh, yeah, you know that's that's going to happen quick. And so the stuff we're going to be seeing coming out. I mean, that, those images of Jupiter, holy crap, very yeah. cool. I know they're trying to probably balance out the what's the most effective thing to really test out the capabilities, while also being able to prove to like the public that it was worth. 10 billion dollar price tag and be like this is really really cool we want to kind of balance it between we want to do what we want but also showcase what it can do and show yeah. that it was worth it so yeah i mean nasa um, esa these are publicly funded canadian space agency these are publicly funded institutions and so or agencies and so they have to they have to show their metal they have to prove their worth uh and so it's like that jupiter image that came out um that was an engineering that was a test right uh if you want to look at solar system objects um, there, that's moving. JWST is orbiting the sun, and so these things are moving relatively rapidly. And so they said, "Look, we have to test that we can track solar system objects. Uh, it can't point at anything closer to the sun, basically, than Mars. That's not strictly true, but you know, in a rule of thumb, uh, because you, you'd have to turn the telescope to look closer to the sun, and they don't want any of that light leaking onto the telescope and warming it up. And it's like, well, Jupiter's big and bright." And it's, you know, it's still on the other side of the sun right now, so it's relatively far away. Let's take a look at that, and, you know, and it'll make dynamite pictures. And then, boom, you're seeing all this detail in the cloud tops. You can see the ring. Uh, there's, there's what looks to be a haze layer in this image. That, like, and all the astronomers I know who study Jupiter, they were like, uh, what's that? You know, what's that yeah. arc we're gonna on the be, side uh, of Jupiter? And, busy and for a while is that, so. is that an image artifact did we screw something up or is like is that a haze layer above the atmosphere and i think a lot of them are leaning towards yeah that's real and it's just it was lit up by the sun because of the angle and jwst just saw it yeah phenomenal so we're at the last 10 minutes this is normally where we open it up to questions for anybody who's watching so if you have questions blah, blah, blah. uh throw them out there uh, first one comes from, oh, Jay had one, uh, a paper just came out with a possible redshift 20 galaxy. So really far back. How far back do you think, uh, JWST will go? It's, it's, that's really interesting. I mean, a Z of 20 means that the, 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 the wavelength of light has been stretched by a factor of 21. So if this thing, if this thing were emitting at a 10th of a micron, now it's emitting at 2.1 microns. Uh, and that means that this galaxy is really, really far away. And in fact, it existed 200 or, or so million years after the Big Bang. Um, that's, and again, right, it's a candidate. We don't know. They're, they're looking at the colors of this galaxy and estimating how its redshift. Um, we really, really, really need spectra. And the problem with that is it's faint. And so even JWST is going to have to stare at this thing for a long time to be able to get spectra. Um, but you're not going to, it, it, you're probably not going to see galaxies much farther away because the universe hadn't existed long enough for galaxies to form. And, and these observations, if these candidates are confirmed to be at these distances, um, that means that galaxies formed even earlier than we thought. And it's not so much that, I mean, we know stars started forming 
sometime around then. So, you know, seeing stars themselves is fine. But the fact that one of these galaxies seems to be forming itself into a disk, uh, it, it's, that's a really sort of difficult observation. You look at the data and it's kind of, you know, you have to kind of hem and haw. But if this thing really is forming itself into a disk, that's a lot earlier than, than, than uh, the models show it should. And so that's showing that, you know, we need to understand how are these things doing this? Uh, and if you try to look back to 100 million years after the Big Bang, stars, you know, stars shouldn't have existed back then necessarily. Uh, so if we do see those, that's interesting. Um, but the point, the, point, the point is, it's like trying to find baby pictures of yourself before you were born. You can only yeah. go back so far in time before you did not exist. And it's the same thing with galaxies. So there is going to be an upper limit to how far JWST sees galaxies. Um, uh, and, and, you know, and at some point, at a Z of 40, their, their light is redshifted into, into sub-millimeter wavelengths where, mm. where JWST can't see either. I, I don't know exactly where. It's it's gonna, I know it's going to rewrite the way we look at things quite a bit. Yeah, so, I mean, even these first Hubble. images, clearly. If the, like I said, if these candidates are confirmed, yeah, we're going to have to rethink how galaxies form. That's amazing. The first image is taken. Yeah. Yikes. Uh, next question: What does it all? Why does it always seem that galaxies are in a plane or flat uh, shape? It's confusing to me. <laughs> galaxies actually come in four shapes. Um, there's f the the disk that you're used to seeing these gorgeous spiral galaxies like the Milky Way. There are elliptical ones which are puffier. They look like uh, cotton balls, um, and they can be spherical or stretched out um, like footballs. Uh, then there's um, irregulars, which can just be all kinds of weird shapes. And peculiar, which I always like there. They have a shape, but it's weird. And you can find like ring galaxies, galaxies that are shaped like a ring. Um, and so it, it, it's, a, it's not irregular. It has a regular shape. It's just weird. Uh, and those are sort of the four basic shapes that they come in. And it just depends on how they form and what happens to them later. Um, you know, I don't know what the cutting edge thinking is on this. But for example... Um, if galaxies collide, there's a lot of energy involved. And the stars, when the stars all start to orbit each other and everything, that can puff up a galaxy and turn it into an elliptical. Um, there are galaxies like Centaurus A, which is clearly an elliptical galaxy, but it also has sort of a spiral pattern of dust in it. It probably ate a, a disk galaxy, a spiral galaxy, and all that dust was ripped out of it and formed that flat spiral shape. It's all just physics. Right, mm -hmm. colliding stars and gas clouds are colliding and they're stretching each other out and doing all this stuff. And that's why a lot of these have weird shapes. And in fact, uh, one last thing, if you look at the, at the JWST deep image or the Hubble deep images, distant galaxies tend to have these irregular shapes. And that's because we think early on in the universe for a few hundred million years, they were chaotic. They, 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 there wasn't enough organization for them. The stars hadn't interacted gravitationally enough for them to sort of form these nice overall shapes like flatten into a disc or a puffy elliptical. And so when you look at them, they're all stretched out in weird shape. And then later, as, they, as the universe got older, as we start to see galaxies that are sort of closer to us, um, that's when you start to see them forming themselves into these more coherent shapes. Hmm. It's a mess. Yeah. It's a mess. <laughs> it's a mess. And, and um, there's a million different reasons for this. So that's, that's my hand wavy uh, description. Um, so next question. How did the micrometeorite impact JWST image capability? Yeah, that was scary. Um, so it's spaces, used now. So uh, <laughs> yeah, we're, it, it's fine. JWST is fine. It's still performing better than spec, mind you. It's still performing better than the original on paper. Here's how we want it to perform. It's still doing way better than that. Um, but there are tiny little meteorite meteors in, in meteoroids in space pieces of dust, whatever, um, that are microscopic. And we, we, don't, we don't exactly know what the population is of these out where JWST is. We kind of know what it's like in the near-Earth environment because we've had satellites up for decades. And these things get hit all the time. And so we, we kind of have an, have an idea of what, that, what that's like. Out at L2, which is a, a million and a half kilometers out, we're not exactly sure. But they have models. And they said, yeah, you know, by, by the time... We unfold JWST to the time we start taking images we expect to be hit this many times by tiny ones. Um, and that had happened. Actually, it had been hit four or five times by little ones. And then uh, sprang, it got hit by something bigger. I still have not seen 
anybody say how big they think it was. Um, but it hit one of the 18 gold mirrors, the one labeled C3. You can find these online. Uh, and uh, yeah, damaged the mirror. It, 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 it basically hit it and carved a pit. Um, this pit is very, very, very small. This is a 1.3 meter mirror in a very, very, very tiny pit. And yeah, sure, it does measurably affect how that thing is, is reflecting light. But measurable doesn't mean big. It just means, you know, they can, they can see that there's been a change. But they've also been able to uh, uh, realign the mirror and everything to counteract a lot of that. Um, and JWST was designed specifically to be able to counteract these effects. And that's why uh, it's still performing super well. It was bad. And it's just bad statistics, right? You, I mean, it, it was just this random chance. They weren't expecting it hit this big this quickly. Um, a lot of people still think, eh, it sucks, but it's just, it's a fluke. It's like flipping a coin five times and getting five heads in a row. It'll happen yeah. uh, by random chance, but you hope that over the long run, you're not going to get hit this many times by stuff that big. Sure. Uh, I've got a couple more questions. We'd love to have you back on, by the way, if you're ever interested. Cause it's oh, always absolutely. Cool and you know me. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, the hour no, goes too quickly because I We can too talk much. all day long. <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, the other question is, uh, we can only see the observable universe. So what is beyond the oldest galaxy? Thinking linear, linearly, does the universe go outwards in every direction? Yeah, this part's very confusing. Um, there are astronomers who have a much better grip on this than I do, like Katie Mack. And she writes about this on Twitter all the time, Astro Katie, and, and there are others. Um, and, this, and I'll tell you, uh, my brain doesn't wrap around this stuff very well. There's stuff I, I get right away. Uh, I understand, you know, planetary nebulae, but when it comes to, you know, how big is the observable universe, my brain goes, yeah, no, we're done. Um, yeah. But yeah, basically, um, the universe is, if the universe were finite and not expanding, then over some course of time, the light from the other side of it would reach you and you would be able to see the entire universe. Um, but it's expanding. And in fact, it's expanding in a sense faster than light. It's a, that, it's a, complicated thing uh the galaxies are not physically moving away from us faster than the speed of light but space itself is expanding and they're kind of being swept along with it um it's not a perfect analogy and like i said so all of this gets very confusing um but what happens is there's only so far back in time we can see 13.8 billion years because that's how old the universe is um but there are galaxies that are moving away from us that uh, in a sense they're light has not had enough time to reach us yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the observable universe, what you can see is you can see a galaxy 13.8 billion years, 13.8 billion light years away, kind of. That's how long it took the light to reach us. But in the meantime, the, uh, when that light was emitted, our galaxies were very close together, but we've been moving apart and that light has had to catch up. So now you can think of now, not a great concept. Einstein showed that now doesn't really exist. You have to kind of define what now means. But if you want to think of it as now, these two galaxies are now much, much, much farther apart. Um, and so the observable universe has a finite size, but there are, there's a possibly a much larger universe out there where the light hasn't had enough time to reach us. And I've seen different numbers for it, and I don't... And, and again, I mean, this is sort of the extent of how I understand it. I never took a class in, in general relativity. So this stuff kind of confuses me, to be, to be just brutally honest. Um, kind of like tides, I guess. So it's like you're you're out in the ocean. You take a picture of your friend, um, but if at some point your friend gets swept up by a wave, and then you take that picture after, it's like the time and distance has changed from that spot. And, and in fact, that's a good analogy because the Earth is round and we have a horizon. So if you're sitting here and you look to the horizon, you can see ten kilometers away, whatever, something like that. But there's a whole planet out there beyond that horizon that exists. You just can't see it. And so you kind of assume the universe is homogeneous. It's the same on large scales everywhere. So what I assume is, yes, if there's more universe out there we can't see, it's not made of antimatter. Time doesn't run backwards. Ghosts don't exist on, you know. It's, it's, it, the physics is roughly the same, and there are probably galaxies and stars and things just like that. It's just that we can't see them. They're, they're beyond the horizon of what we can see. Probably should have gone that direction. That would have been a lot. Simpler. That's all right. That works. <laughs> um, 
that pretty much wraps up our hour. I know we could probably go for much more time, but Phil, I thank you very much. I'm sure everyone who's been watching, um, it's been a lot of fun having you on and definitely would like to have you back to talk about something else. I'm sure, sure. cool that will pop up. So yeah, there will um, be, there will be some interesting observations from J like after it observes supernova 87, a, let me know because yeah. I mean, have me on because that's what I studied for my PhD and I'm going to be very excited to see those images. In spec we will, uh, I'll make a note of that. Jared, you're watching, make a note of that. So, um, but yeah, if uh, they want to follow you, you're on Instagram, of course. Or do you still do Bad Astronomer? Is that still a website that's up currently? Or on if someone yeah, wanted to check out what you were up to, what's the best way? Sure. Um, uh, right now, my blog is on SciFiWire.com, so you can find me there. But the best way to find all my stuff is to go to About.me/PhilPlate, and I have links to Instagram. I think I'm I'm the Bad Astronomer on Instagram. I'm bad astronomer on Twitter. It was a terrible mistake, but this was all back when social media was new when I started signing up for this. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a I have a newsletter on Substack, badastronomy.substack.com that comes out every Friday or excuse me every Monday for free, and a paid issue on Thursday. So yeah, I'm all over the place. If you go to about.me, you'll find all those links. Easy peasy. Very nice. Well, Phil, thank you so much uh, for hanging out with us. I hope you have a great weekend, everyone who's been hanging out with us. Uh, thanks for watching the What's Up webcast. Uh, um, if you like what you see here, please leave a like, subscribe, let us know we're doing a good job, and we will see you guys next week, and have a safe weekend. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody, a Skywatcher. See ya.